All right, welcome back to the PTZ Camera Operator Handbook. We are at the part in this presentation where we are discussing the components of a PTZ camera. This is an important part because I want you guys to understand what makes up a PTZ camera. We already talked about the state of the industry, what a PTZ camera is, but what makes up a PTZ camera? And I actually went out and opened up one of our PTZ cameras just so that we could really get a good look at what's inside these cameras. What makes them work? There's a lens and the lens is remotely controllable. The lens is where the light comes in and is transferred down into the image sensor. The lens is also the component that optically zooms the camera in and that is all controllable via the serial and network ports of the camera. There's a motor and the motor in this picture, that's actually not that, that uh, actually the motor, I have to change that. I'm going to do this live here. The motor is actually down here. This picture uh, got a little off there. There's the motor there. There's an IR receiver we'll take a look at. And then there's all of the AV connections that we're going to take a look at. And this picture might be maybe a little easier to look at where we have the lens, the motor inside that sleeve there. And then we've got the IR receiver in the front and the AV connections on the back. Now, the PTZ camera motor is an important part of the camera. The motor is what moves the pan and the tilt. And motors do vary in quality, and there's quite a lot of motors out there. Um, the motor can affect the noise of the camera, the physical noise that you can hear measured in decibel levels. Uh, it can also... Uh, help change how quickly the camera can pan, tilt, and zoom. Um, there are different qualities of PTZ cameras, and the higher the quality, the more accurate it can be when it recalls PTZ presets and how quickly it can move when you need it to. The lens itself is used for optical zoom in and out, but also focus. And the lens is important to understand because when you choose a lens, you're not just choosing how far it can zoom in. That's the first thing most people think about, but it also affects the field of view. And the field of view is how wide you can actually see on the image. It's the width of the image. And generally, the higher the optical zoom, the lower the field of view is. And that usually is a good thing. Because if you have a PTZ camera that's 75 feet or 100 feet away from the thing you want to zoom in on, you don't care so much about a wide field of view, and it helps the lens zoom in further if it starts at a more narrow field of view. So those are two things to consider, the field of view and the optical zoom when looking at a lens. And lenses do have different qualities, and you should look at some of the, the test footage and understand the lens that is in the PTZ camera that you are buying. Now, the image sensor is what takes the light from the lens and converts it into a digital image. So the light hits the sensor and it's converted into digital pictures. And CMOS sensors have truly become kind of the standard in the industry. And between the lens and the image sensor, those are the two big limiting factors for image quality. So they, 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 they affect the quality the most. And the CMOS sensor is there to receive the light coming in through the lens. Now, the IR sensor and, of course, the IR remote control is generally in the front of the camera. IR remote controls can generally operate in the neighborhood of 25 to 35, maybe 40 feet away from a PTZ camera in good conditions. IR remote controls do not work well in daylight. Sun can actually block the sensor, the IR sensor that's trying to receive the infrared because too much light is hitting it. So these don't work very well outdoors. And we'll look at the IR remote control in more detail in a specific chapter on it. Now, I wanted to go over a lot of the different connections that are on the back of PTZ cameras so you're familiar with what they can do. Number one on this connection diagram is an audio line in. It's used to bring in a 3.5 millimeter line level 
audio connection. Line level audio connections are much more robust than mic level audio connections. You can't just plug a microphone into a PTZ camera. Likely, the signal source is not high enough. Now, some microphones that have batteries in them, like the Rode mics that I have tested, do work. And you have to just have a high level of audio signal because clearly these PTC cameras don't have amplifiers built in to boost the signal. They need a pretty good audio level connection. CVBS is a composite video interface, and you might have seen this as like a yellow composite video interface. It's also broken out into 3.5 uh, millimeter uh, video inputs now. And it's not used very often, but you might see it there. And it's an analog SD, standard definition video interface. Number three on this list, we looked at in our last video, and this is the system select. And the system select generally will change the entire video resolution setup for your camera. And this is important. I want to I want to take a look at this because at the bottom of your camera, you will most likely find a video resolution chart. And the chart will tell you what the resolution and frame rate is for the resolution dial. And this can solve a lot of problems. You want to make sure all your PTZ cameras are set to the same resolution and frame rate, most likely, in most scenarios. Because you want them to match. You want them to look the same. And that's where that system dial comes into play. Number four is RS-485. RS-485, RS-232, you can see number four, five, and six are very similar. These are analog control cables. And we're going to look more in depth into these in our video about joystick controllers because most people use these analog controls for joysticks. The main difference between RS-485 and RS-232 is the distance in which you can run the cabling. RS-485 works at much longer distances. One of the things you'll notice about RS-232 on this diagram is there's both an in and an out port. And that allows you to daisy chain the control from one PTZ camera to the next. So that's important. Number seven is the network port. And this is becoming sometimes the only port people are using. Because not only can you control the camera with this port, you can send and receive audio and video from this port. You can also um, power the camera with power over Ethernet enabled networking equipment. So a very popular and powerful connection. And it's very modern and it's used for NDI, Dante, and other IP video standards, including SRT, which these may just sound like a bunch of acronyms, but we will go over each one of those in details in the later chapters of our book. Now, getting to HDMI, this is probably one of the most popular connectors and the most commonly used connectors. HDMI, and then next to that, we have SDI. And both of these are digital video outputs, uh, SDI being a serial digital output, HDMI being a more common digital output used with monitors and connections. But the big difference is that SDI has a locking connector. You plug the camera in, you can twist it, you can lock it, it won't pull out, it won't accidentally get disconnected, and it can be run hundreds of feet reliably, whereas HDMI generally has a cabling limitation of just 50 feet. USB 2.0 is a port that is important on some cameras. It's just used for firmware updates. On other cameras, you might see USB 3.0, you might see USB-C. Those would be used for video with a video communication software. You may also see USB-C on newer cameras allowing you to control and power the cameras as well. USB-C is fairly new and we're seeing it only kind of rarely. It's just kind of being rolled out into the PTZ camera world. Of course, you'll have a common power connection and a power switch to turn the camera on and off. So that just gives you an idea of some of the connections. We talked about the resolution chart and the dial 
that allows you to tune the cameras in. That can be turned with a tweaker. It's a small flathead screwdriver that allows you to change the system select um, as well. So these are just some of the cables that we talked about in the industry. You know, how do you choose the right cable? We're going to be talking about that in this online course. But SDI being one that is good for running cables long distances. USB is ideal for plug and play if the uh, camera is close to you. And then Ethernet being one that is very flexible and versatile for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about. Now, each one of these cables has a maximum distance that it can operate in reliably and a maximum bandwidth. And these are things we're going to be discussing in more detail in upcoming chapters. This is a chart that you might want to reference in the future. But in general, Ethernet cabling can generally be run 100 meters, okay, 328 feet. It's a really large amount of, uh, of length that you can get out of that. You can power the cameras, you can control the cameras, you can get video over Ethernet now. It's very versatile. It's becoming a really big standard. HDMI is only 50 feet. But the interesting thing when you look at HDMI versus most of the category 5, 6, and 7 cabling is that it, it, it has more bandwidth, okay? So it has a high, technically a higher quality video. Is it noticeable higher quality for your application? We'll talk about that in a more deep dive chapter about resolution, bit rate, and compression. But for the purpose of this video, just keep in mind the maximum distances and the bandwidths that are available. They do change based on the cable that you use. Regarding bit rates, generally in modern day age, we are going to be doing some type of compression, whether you're mixing cameras together and compressing them when you stream out to YouTube or Facebook, or you're compressing the, all the video sources when you're recording them. It's almost rare in, the, in this day and age not to use some form of compression in video because of how much it saves on data, on bandwidth, and just making more things possible on a infrastructure that you may have. So 4K30 being a, uh, kind of like a high-end bit rate, you know, it, it depends on the type of compression you're using. This would is standard is RTMP. This is like a streaming standard. But we'll look at in more detail other compressions like NDI and Dante that use a little bit less compression. They're higher quality, but they're not meant for streaming over the public internet. They're meant to have high quality connectivity in the local area network. Now, to tie all of this together, I wanted to share this diagram here, which is showing we've got a network switch in the middle, we've got a joystick controller, and this joystick controller is connecting to a lot of different cameras. We're connecting to some cameras at the top over the serial connection. So maybe that's the RS-232 connection. And we're using the in and out ports to control three cameras in a daisy chain, right? It's not different than a home run connection where we see that below that the IP and the Sony and the NDI, each one of those are getting an individual ethernet cable to them. Each one of those are getting an IP address, which you'll learn about more in this online course. And they're each being controlled. Now we've got a smartphone with Wi-Fi access and it's connecting to a Wi-Fi access point, which is also on the network. And we've even got a PTZ camera connecting over the internet, over the public internet using UDP. So we've got a lot going on here. This is where we're headed to understanding these types of more advanced workflows. And we're going to get into IP connectivity, how it all works, and we're going to show why it's important for a PTZ camera to be connected to the network because that's also connected to a wireless access point because that gives your computer the ability to communicate with the camera and your smartphone. So again, we're going to look at the serial connections in more detail on what they do. But as you noticed, it's a little different than Ethernet. We're connecting with actual analog cables, and it's still important to this day. So the key takeaways are PTC cameras are similar to regular cameras, but they've got those integrated robotics that allow us to remotely control them. And once they're getting on the network, that becomes a big deal. P2 
PTZ cameras include motors, lenses, image sensors, and audiovisual connections that make them the ideal tool for video production. PTZ cameras can be controlled remotely through a variety of serial and IP control connections. IP camera controls allow for the integration of popular video production software. And then IP camera controls also allow for Wi-Fi connectivity so that you can control these cameras with a smartphone. And that again becomes a great advantage to you know, what we're doing in video production today.